Hello and welcome to Murder in the UK. Today we're looking at the case of Tony McCluskey. Tony McCluskey murdered his sister, Gemma McCluskey, who was an actress in the British soap opera EastEnders. An argument apparently ensued after an overflowing bath. McCluskey was seen with a suitcase on CCTV heading towards Regent's Canal. Two days later, a female body was found floating in the Regent's Canal. Kluski was sentenced to life imprisonment. What are your thoughts on this case? Please leave a comment below and let me know. If you want further information, visit www.murderuk.com or stay tuned right here for a video documentary about this case. Thank you. The 3rd of March 2012. It's a typical Saturday evening for the officers on duty in London's East End. But when three people show up at the station to report a young woman missing, it becomes a night none of them will ever forget. The two men identified themselves as the missing woman's brothers, Tony and Danny, and the friend as Nicole. They're filling out the report, and as soon as they get to the name, the officers know this isn't going to be a typical case. The person that was missing was Gemma McCluskey. She was an actress who'd most famously been in EastEnders, which is a very famous soap. Everybody in Britain has seen this program. They said that she'd uh, not been seen for two days, and they were very concerned about where she might be and what danger she might be in. The last person to have seen Gemma was her brother, Tony. She lived with Tony and her mother in the flat in Shoreditch. Tony said she'd left the house on Thursday, but she hadn't said how long she was going for, where she was going, anything. He said it was out of character for her to be missing for this length of time. Given the circumstances of her disappearance, police aren't initially that concerned. At that point, there's no sign of foul play. She could be back any moment. She's only been gone for two days. Gemma was a grown woman. She, you know, had her own mind. It's perfectly legitimate. She could have just gone off with a friend for a few days. It was considered and recorded as a low-risk investigation at that stage. But with each passing hour, that assessment begins to change. Gemma was an avid user of social media. She had lots of friends and was always online texting and speaking to her friends and family. And nobody had heard from her. There was a, a growing concern about where Gemma was and what had happened. Gemma McCluskey was born on the 5th of February, 1983. She was raised in a working-class family in London's East End. Gemma's father was a builder and the primary breadwinner. Her mother was a traditional homemaker. Together, they did their best to provide a nurturing environment for their children. They lived in Pelter Street, which is in Shoreditch near the Hackney Road. Historically, there's a lot of East Enders with two or three generations living there, and Gemma and Gemma's family were part of that a lot of people from that area speak with a, a Cockney accent, <laughs> and they're proud to. It's a very famous area. For many, many years, the area was known for crime and for poverty. But when Gemma was growing up, the area was improving. Shoreditch was on the up. It's now quite a bijou, um, arty type of area. Lots of pubs, clubs and restaurants. Unfortunately, Gemma's parents split up but it didn't seem to affect her in any adverse way. She was still a confident, bubbly young girl who loved to be the center of attention. Gemma's big personality seemed perfect for the stage. That was the only big thing about her. As an adult, she was only four feet, 11 inches tall. And everyone said she just seemed to have this light that shone from within. There was never any doubt that Gemma was destined to be a star. She was a great character, perfect for acting. And she trained as an actress from quite an early age. She had a place at drama school at seven. So, you know, her career was looking pretty promising. 
At 17, she landed this plum job, an absolute dream for a girl of that age to appear in EastEnders. She was in more than 30 episodes playing Kerry Skinner. She was linked to quite a few of the major characters and in a number of memorable storylines. However, just as her star seemed to be rising, Gemma's career suffered a major blow. One minute, she's on top of the world doing what she loves. The next minute, she's written out of the series. She still had huge hopes and ambitions to be a success on stage and screen. She did one or two little extra things, including one TV series which wasn't uh, memorable in any way. And then, uh, sadly, the jobs started drying up. So in her 20s, Gemma decided to take a break from acting. She found herself a job in a local pub which suited her in terms of hours and that she could go to from home quite easily. The truth was that she seemed really happy. She enjoyed being out of the spotlight for a while. Gemma had been so busy with her career during her teenage years that she kind of missed out on quite a few things, like having that special relationship with her mum. Gemma had a few friends and had dated a few guys, but unlike most young women, she wanted to live at home with her mother and her brother. Family meant a lot to her. Having her family close by meant even more when Gemma's mother, Pauline, suddenly became ill. 28-year-old Gemma became her caregiver. In late 2011, Gemma's mother was diagnosed with a brain tumor, and she had to go into hospital for the treatment. Her diagnosis came as a huge blow to Gemma and to the rest of the family. And to make matters worse, she contracted an infection, which meant that she had to remain hospitalized. Since then, Gemma had devoted her life to taking care of her mother, visiting her in the hospital daily. But now, six weeks after her mother was hospitalized, Gemma has mysteriously disappeared and her loved ones have begun to fear the worst. Family members organized a search and they took people who knew her to hang up missing persons posters all over London's East End. Gemma's former co-stars, Martine McCutcheon, Brooke Kinsella, and Natalie Cassidy all posted about her disappearance on social media to raise awareness and to appeal for information. Gemma's face is instantly recognizable to millions of people, so it's hard to believe she could just disappear without a trace. You don't want to jump to conclusions, but between losing her acting career and now her mother, it's not hard to imagine her reaching a breaking point, going off the grid, or maybe even taking her own life. London police are investigating the sudden disappearance of 29-year-old Gemma McCluskey, the popular former actress of EastEnders fame. Friends told police that on that morning she'd gone to the Royal London Hospital in Whitechapel where a new wing was being opened because a friend of hers child was in the school choir and was singing. She was photographed at the ceremony wearing a distinctive yellow top and blue leggings with a Louis Vuitton handbag, and she recorded the choir on a cell phone. As time went on, there was a growing concern about where Gemma was and what had happened. There was a campaign set up to try and find her. They had missing persons posters, and even some of her co-stars from EastEnders were sending out messages on social media. I can only imagine being a friend or a family member. I mean, your mind just wanders to some pretty dark places. Hours after filing the missing persons report, Gemma's family receives a possible tip friends were making inquiries locally and they went into a kebab shop and one of the people that was serving in there said that they thought they remembered Gemma coming in on the Thursday evening. The last person to see Gemma had been her brother Tony so news of another sighting not only brought a lot of hope it also helped narrow down the time to when she was last seen. One of the officers went into the kebab shop spoke to the individual that had given that account but unfortunately, when police check the shop's CCTV cameras for the night of the 1st of March, they come up empty. It became apparent that they were mistaken, that Gemma hadn't actually been there that night. The police were back at square one. They didn't know where they were going. Meanwhile, with all the posters and social media presence, the story begins to spread like wildfire. The national newspaper got involved as well, and there were appeals printed, have you seen this girl? 
Despite Gemma's popularity and widespread awareness of her disappearance, days continue to pass without any further leads. The pressure was mounting in the press and from the family and her friends for some action. We go to the local shops in the area, the local council, authority, cameras, private CCTV addresses in and around the area of where Gemma lived to see if we can identify her coming or going. Unfortunately, there was no CCTV directly onto the address itself. But then, five days into the search, Gemma's older brother, Tony, is contacted by someone who claims to know exactly where Gemma is. Tony received a series of telephone calls on the 6th of March, where somebody was purporting to have Gemma and was demanding a ransom for her return. The first call, the demand was to bring two million pounds to Bentley International Station if he ever wanted to see her alive again. On the second call, the chap demanded the same amount of money plus $500 in Iraqi money. When Tony asked to speak to his sister, the supposed kidnapper said she'd been stripped of her clothes and was being held in a room. The calls were quite frightening. Investigators quickly traced the call to an address over 30 miles away in Kent. I deployed a number of officers to go to that address to identify the actual individual that made the calls and then to arrest that person. When they arrived, Gemma wasn't there. It turns out the whole thing was just a cruel hoax. It was a sad teenage man who had no connection with the case whatsoever but had wasted a massive amount of police time and had taken the uh, detectives completely off the scent. The chap tells us that he had been with a lot of his mates drinking and smoking weed that day, that they'd found online this poster requesting any information about Gemma's disappearance. And they thought between them that it would be a bit of a laugh to torment the person that were requesting that information. And that's how that came about. He was uh, prosecuted on that basis. He got charged with an offence under the Malicious Communications Act, for which he did eventually serve a prison sentence. Police immediately resumed the investigation. But unfortunately, six days after her disappearance, the search for Gemma McCluskey is about to come to a tragic end. Within hours of the ransom calls, police received a report about a suspicious object floating in Regent's Canal, close to Hackney's famous Broadway market. Regent's Canal is about three miles north of the city of London. It runs all the way through the east end of London and out effectively into the basin. A woman navigating a barge down the canal came across a suitcase. And when it was fished out, the spring just immediately opened, and the most gruesome sight imaginable was inside. It was the headless torso of a woman, and there were distinguishing marks that suggested it was the partial remains of Gemma McCluskey. We were aware that Gemma had a butterfly tattoo on the small of her back, and that was what the torso had. The remains are brought to the medical examiner, who confirms the identification. DNA tests soon confirmed this was, in fact, Gemma's body. And this alarming news quickly spread across London. What started as a missing persons case was now a murder investigation. But there was no sign of the head, and without this evidence, there was no way of determining the cause of death. Gemma's family, they are absolutely horrified, as are Gemma's friends and the local community. They had always hoped that she would be found alive, and this was a, a terrible blow to find out that not only uh, had she been murdered, but in the most gruesome manner imaginable. And a big question now was, who would want to kill Gemma McCluskey, and why? Any murder of this nature is going to grab people's attention, but 
It wasn't just the family and loved ones that were affected by this. It was everyone that had seen on the TV. Gemma felt important to a lot of people. Everybody is aghast, and there's a lot of pressure on the police at that stage to identify who's responsible. Teams of divers are immediately dispatched to search the canal for the rest of her body. We're not only looking for Gemma's body parts, of course, but anything that she may have been wearing at the time or her mobile telephone. Over the course of the next few days, they found a series of limbs that had been disposed of in rubbish bags. They were all recovered at different times and in different locations. They were packaged in a similar way. The divers never came up with anything else, and the fact that the head was never found suggested that the killers, the murderers, were trying to hide her identity. A pathologist confirms that the severed limbs came from Gemma's body, but there are also signs that whoever killed her wasn't simply trying to get rid of the evidence. When the pathologist looked at the torso, there were some marks and bruises on the body. But the things that were shocking about it was that there had been nearly 100 hacks or axe marks to the torso. To keep at it that long? Now, that's not the act of a cold, calculated killer. It's more about anger, pent-up rage. But here's the thing, who would have been that angry at Gemma. Since Gemma's killer already has several days' head start on them, police know time is of the essence. The first thing they had to do uh, was to find out exactly where Gemma had been uh, on the day that she disappeared, so they could trace a timeline of her movements. They were trying to figure out what had happened in her last moments alive on March the 1st. Investigators know that she attended a ceremony at a hospital in Whitechapel the morning she disappeared. Her friend Erica had a daughter who was singing in the choir there, and Gemma recorded it for her. After the events finished, Gemma goes to her friend's house to show her friend footage of the daughter singing. Erica told police she was thrilled to see the video and uh, they'd all had a couple of drinks, gone round to hers, had a bit of a party. But Erica now recalls that Gemma seemed agitated during the party. When she asked her what was wrong, Gemma said she'd had a fight with her 35-year-old brother, Tony. She lived there with her brother, Tony, and her mother, Pauline. Albeit, Pauline had been in a local hospital for a six-week period. Tony and Gemma, they'd had a contentious relationship for a long time. While Gemma was excelling at school, he was struggling. Tony was a bully at school. He was disruptive. He was a complete academic failure and left school in pretty much in disgrace without any qualifications. Eventually, through his father, managed to get, you know, some low-level employment, manual working jobs. His father actually bought him a set of, of his own tools, which is extremely expensive, to get him started. Well, that didn't last very long because Tony had no interest in that. Tony seemed to lack motivation. He just drifted from one job to the other until eventually he landed up in a job as a part-time window cleaner. But the difference in their ambitions wasn't the only thing that had driven a wedge between the two siblings. While Gemma was focused on a career, Tony preferred to spend his time at home drinking and smoking weed. He smoked up to 15 joints a day. The house stank of it. Tony's habitual drug use caused massive problems and was a big contention between him and Gemma. Gemma's friends tell police that the older the two got, the more of an impact Tony's attitude seemed to have on their relationship. Compared to his sister Gemma, Tony was essentially a failure in his life. And it seems to be that he built up a heavy resentment towards other members of his family who were more successful than him. Tony had embittered feelings about Gemma's acting success. He felt like she was a bit full of it. After their mother was hospitalized, tensions between the two reached a boiling point. Their mum, Pauline, had acted as a buffer between the two of them. So when she left home to have treatment for her brain tumor, 
Tony in general just left to argue. Tony's life just seemed to be going downhill. He'd uh, had trouble with his girlfriend and his drug use was getting worse. Gemma had to handle everything with him just sitting on the couch. So it's not hard to see how that would have thrown fuel on the fire. It was now open warfare between brother and sister and only a matter of time before they fell out so spectacularly that one or the other was going to kick the other one out. But is a sibling rivalry, even one as heated as this seemed to be, enough to make Tony commit such an unspeakable crime? You can see how this would have led to fights, but this had been going on for decades. So why now? Think about it. This is a brother not only murdering his sister, but mutilating her, hacking her to pieces. I mean, who could have done this? Investigators have just learned about an ongoing feud between Gemma McCluskey and her 35-year-old brother, Tony. But their sibling rivalry seems to have finally reached its breaking point the day she was murdered. She and a few girlfriends were having this impromptu party, and she brought it up. She'd had a fallout with her brother, Tony, that morning because he'd left the taps on in the bathroom and it had flooded the house. She's been left at the house while Pauline, their mother, has gone into the hospital to have this treatment for the cancer. Gemma's in charge of the house. This was just symptomatic of the sort of behavior she'd become used to and she was frustrated by. While those girls are discussing that, Gemma actually receives a telephone call from Tony and there's an argument that goes on where Tony is shouting at Gemma. He's so loud, they all hear him through the phone. And this is the last straw for Gemma. She decides she has been putting up with him for far too long. She told him, pack your bags, get out. I'm going off now, and when I come back, I do not expect you to be here. Tony's response to that ultimatum was to ignore it. He was going nowhere, and she could take a jump as far as he was concerned. Gemma left Erica's around 1 p.m., and she headed home to confront Tony. Did Gemma's attempt to evict Tony from their home end in her death? Her friends believe it's possible. They were told police that Gemma uh, would appear from time to time in dark glasses. She would have bruises on her arms and complain that Tony was hitting her about. If Tony had been abusing her, it's not hard to see how this could have led to murder. But at this stage, they do not have a shred of evidence. Investigators obtain a search warrant for the McCluskey home, hoping to find some evidence linking Tony to the crime. In the kitchen, there was a knife block. And in the knife block, one of the knives had some blood on it. Now. That sounds great and evidentially. However, you know, who's not cut their hand on a sharp knife at some stage in a kitchen? In the bathroom, they also find some very small blood spots that turn out to be Gemma's. But once again, it's a tiny amount of blood, and there are dozens of reasons why a spot of her blood might be there. It wasn't enough huge amounts of blood that, you know, would be clear signs of a dismemberment activity. The forensic techs also didn't find any sign of a cleanup. If somebody was murdered in blood spatters and you wipe it down, we can use chemical agents. You can see the, you know, the clear up marks and all this. But there wasn't any of that. But does it mean Tony is innocent? From the time that Gemma went missing, Tony had, had been engaged with the police in terms of providing the police with a photograph of her reporting her missing. Not only that, but Tony had given them a timeline that meant he was the last person to see her. Now, you wouldn't do that unless you were arrogant or stupid. He was doing things to try and help the investigation. It makes you think that maybe Gemma's friends had misread the relationship. I mean, you can still be close and fight. Police looked through Tony's text messages and found that he had sent a message to his sister the morning after she had last been seen, telling her that he had been to the hospital 
and seen the mother and that she was fine. He signed it, love ya, which was something that caught people's eye. They canvassed the area and spoke to Gemma's neighbours to find out what their impressions were of Tony. Well, Tony's use of skunk cannabis was known not only to his family, uh, to his friends, but most people in and around the local area. In the USA, when you say skunk weed, it's referring to a strain of marijuana that has a really strong smell. In the UK, when you say skunk weed, you're referring to something with a really high THC level, something really strong. That information confirms Tony's drug use, but again, it's not proof of anything. Stoners aren't typically known to be violent killers. We looked into Tony's background. He did have a bit of minor police history in terms of he'd been arrested on a couple of occasions for low-level violence and a bit of drug misuse. But when police look into the allegations of domestic violence, a clearer picture of Tony's character begins to emerge. We established a couple of violent incidents between the two previously. Their father told us that Tony had actually gone for Gemma at one stage and kind of put his hands around her throat. And we found some documentation from about six or seven years previous to this where Pauline had wanted to the council to rehouse Tony because he'd become too unmanageable. Studies have shown that over the past 10 years, half the women who've been murdered were killed as a result of domestic abuse. Now, it's usually someone the victim has an intimate relationship with, like a husband or a boyfriend. But in Tony's case, with the escalation of violence, it seemed he would be perfectly capable of murder. The record of abuse causes investigators to consider Tony's text to Gemma in an entirely different light. Many times, an abuser will show signs of remorse immediately after a violent outburst as a way of controlling the victim. Something like that could be going on here. Police obtained Tony's phone records, and they went through all his phone calls, his texts, his geographical data, just to find out where he'd been that day. Police also review the statements they've collected, and several inconsistencies jump out. Tony had told some of his friends that the last time he'd seen Gemma was on the morning of Gemma's disappearance. On another occasion to a different friend, he'd told them that it was in the afternoon. It turned out that on the day he'd reported Gemma missing, several people had noticed that he had an injury on his hand. At the time, no one knew she'd been killed, so it didn't seem suspicious but he'd given friends and family different explanations about how it happened. At one stage, he'd called it in a gate. On another occasion, we, we'd found out from somebody that he'd been involved in a fight. It's enough to make Tony their primary suspect. The fact that he had had a row with her that day, that he had seemed to be a bit shifty, it kind of gave us reasonable grounds to suspect he was involved. However, up till now, all of the evidence is highly circumstantial. So the question is, how are they going to prove it? With this being such a high-profile case, the last thing they want to do is to charge the wrong person with the murder. Police were in a very difficult position. It's very difficult to judge how to treat members of a grieving family, particularly when one is a prime suspect. They didn't have a, a smoking gun, so to speak. But with evidence of Tony's drug use and the escalating violence between Tony and Gemma, they had a lot of reason to fear the worst. He was purporting to be, you know, a loving brother. And that wasn't the case. Police were convinced they had the right man. So they decided that they were going to rattle his cage and see what he had to say. But when Tony is informed that he's under arrest, he invokes his right to remain silent. As a witness, he was really helpful and cooperative and willing to provide explanations. But immediately, as a suspect, we get very little from Tony. He wants to play the grieving brother. However, when he gradually starts to recognize that his story isn't playing out the way he wishes it to, he becomes obstructive. 
He replied to every question with the words, no comment. While Tony had the right to stay silent, it didn't look good for his innocence. If you are innocent, your natural reaction is to trip over yourself arguing as to why you are innocent. And people who fail to do that very quickly shine a light on their guilt. Tony's interrogation may have convinced police he's guilty, but they still need proof. From the time that Tony was arrested and was being interviewed, obviously other inquiries are going on as well. The reviewing of C's closed circuit television, the looking at telephone records, the speaking to family and friends. One of the things they kept coming back to was that affectionate text from Tony to Gemma. It just seemed totally out of character. Tony had never used that phrase, love you, in any of his previous texts to Gemma. Examination of history of his texts and the relationship between the brother and sister showed them clearly that he had never shown her any affection at all. In contrast, virtually every text had an aggressive tone. That seemed as if what he was doing was covering his tracks if the police ever thought he might be involved. However, their biggest lead comes from analysis of the phone calls Tony made the next day. On the evening of March 2nd, just after Gemma had disappeared, Tony had called a minicab service. The minicab driver remembered the telephone call and they remembered the person. When the driver went to pick him up, he had a large suitcase with him. It's extremely heavy. And Tony had given him an odd explanation. He had asked Tony what's in it to which Tony replied, a stereo system. Uh, well, the caveat, we had no idea what it was, but he was convinced that whatever it was, it wasn't stereo equipment. The address Tony gave him turned out to be even stranger. From the account given by the driver, the car is driven to a road called Dunstan Road, which is right next to the canal where Gemma's torso is found. Police seized the taxi and had it forensically examined and inside the trunk, they found Gemma's blood. Investigators immediately review the CCTV cameras surrounding the location where the cab dropped Tony off. Because of the length of the canal and the current, detectives hadn't known where Gemma's remains were dumped. They also didn't know exactly what to look for, but now they not only had a specific address, but a specific time as well. Theoretically, police could have pulled footage from all the CCTV cameras all along the canal, but that would have taken months. They would have been looking for a needle in a haystack, but at least now they knew what and who they were looking for. And what we saw is an image of a man, who, of course, we now know to be Tony, dragging this suitcase along the canal. Footage from another CCTV camera showed Tony later that night going home without the suitcase. The new evidence gives detectives a much clearer picture of what happened. Investigators deduced that Tony killed Gemma in their home after she arrived back from the small party held at her friend Erica's home. It seemed pretty clear that Gemma had come home in a furious temper to find Tony still in the house and had confronted him with her ultimatum that he had to be out and that the struggle had been sparked by that moment and that was how she met her death. The fact that Tony left with a suitcase means he must have dismembered his sister in the house and there was so little blood he must have taken extraordinary precautions to prevent that. The forensics team sprayed the house with luminol and they only found the tiniest traces of blood, which means Tony either took extraordinary precautions or that he had spent hours scrubbing the place. He's done sort of some cover up at the crime scene. He's got some, perhaps some tarpaulins. He's perhaps got some overalls. Police suspect that the traces of Gemma's blood on the kitchen knife meant it was one of the tools he'd used but they knew it wouldn't hold much weight with a jury for the same reasons they initially overlooked it. Post-mortem examination showed that it had taken more effort to sever the first limb than the rest. This supports the theory that he started off by using a knife and then progressed to using an ax. He might have gone and bought the ax or a sharp knife, 
we never found the weapon. We never found the clean-up tools, if that was the case. But that's most likely what's happened. On the 10th of March 2012, 10 days after Gemma's disappearance, Tony McCluskey is formally charged with her murder. Within 24 hours of Tony McCluskey being arrested, he was charged. The police had all the evidence they needed now. However, the one thing they still didn't have was a cause of death, which could be a problem when the case went to trial. On Monday, the 12th of March, Tony McCluskey appears before the Thames Magistrates Court. He stands accused of the brutal murder and dismemberment of his sister, former television star Gemma McCluskey. His motive seemed to be a combination of anger and resentment that built up over the course of their sibling rivalry and her attempt to kick him out of the house. The trial date was set, but the prosecutors still realized they had a really big hole in the case, and that was the cause of death. The dismemberment had made it impossible to determine. They realized that if they couldn't show that, that was leaving the door open to an acquittal. On the 9th of September, detectives would finally get the answers they'd been looking for. The final piece of evidence turned up before the trial started, and this was Gemma's head from another part of the canal. The circumstances of that were that local members of the community were clearing out the rubbish near side basin for a local event, and her head was discovered within a kind of a bin bag. A forensic examination of Gemma's skull confirms that she was beaten to death. We know from the pathologist that there are bruises to Gemma's limbs. So there's been a fight, and she's probably been pushed or punched, or an altercation has taken place between the two of them. From the state of the skull, the pathologist was able to deduce that Gemma had been struck twice with a heavy, blunt object. So two significant blunt force trauma bruises to the skull. He's hit her with something really heavy, and that has cracked her skull, and she's died as a result of that. Armed with this new evidence, prosecutors are confident going into the trial. Opening arguments begin on the 14th of January, 2013. Prosecutor Chris Benalik, you see, betrayed Tony McCluskey as a jealous and vengeful brother who was a failure. He couldn't hold down a job or keep his life together. He resented Gemma. He resented her for the success she had that he would never achieve. Instead of trying to improve his life, Tony just turned to drug use. His drug intake was going up and up. He was consuming vast quantities of skunk cannabis, the heaviest and most lethal variety. On a daily basis, was drinking uh, huge amounts of alcohol. He had no idea what he wanted to do with himself, but he knew he hated his sister. Tony McCluskey was a worthless individual who'd been sponging off his more successful sister until finally he decided that he could put up with her no longer. Tony pleads not guilty to murder. But rather than claim Tony's innocence, the defense argues that he should be convicted of the lesser charge of manslaughter. Tony admitted that when Gemma came home, they'd gotten into a fight and it had just escalated out of control. He told jurors that he remembered Gemma shouting at the top of her voice, why are you still here? Why aren't you out? He then said that his sister came at him with a knife and that in self-defense, he grabbed her wrists and forced her to the ground. From that moment on, his memory blacks out. He says he snapped and has no memory of dismembering the body or covering up a murder. However, the prosecution argues that Tony's actions following Gemma's death prove he's lying. This wasn't a spontaneous act of loss of control. This was something that, once he had killed his sister, he set about firstly destroying the evidence and then laying a very detailed and extraordinarily convoluted cover-up story. This was a man, a killer, who was knowing exactly what he did and exactly how he was going to escape justice. 
The fact that he organizes searches, texts her phone pretending that he's worried about her, that demonstrates that he really was intending to pull the wool over the eyes of the police. It's as simple as that. What we know now is that Tony doesn't get rid of the body on the Thursday, on the 1st. He's got his dead sister's body in the house, and he's got to get rid of that somehow. And in the next 12, 24 hours, he clearly works out what he's going to do, and he's going to cut Gemma up and take her and put her into the local canal. That's the choice he made. The jury agrees, and on the 30th of January, they render their verdict. Tony's found guilty of murder and jailed for a minimum term of 20 years. He won't be released until 2033 at the very earliest. The claims of amnesia was clearly a complete and utter load of rubbish, and the jury was not going to fall for stuff like that. They convicted him by 11 to 1 majority. It had begun as a sibling rivalry, but it ended in a way no one could have ever imagined. When the guilty verdict was returned, there were gasps around the court from Gemma's family and friends, not so much in surprise, but in the shock final realization that her own brother had carried out this brutal murder. The way that Tony seems to be so adept at dealing with a dead body, to have the guts, the stomach for that, that's not consistent with being an empathic human being. That's devastating for any family member to look inwards and see that they've been living with such an individual. Gemma and Tony's father, Anthony McCluskey, was desperate to maintain some contact. Having lost his daughter, he didn't want to lose his son as well. What he wanted was some sign of remorse so that he could stretch his arms out in forgiveness towards his son. Five years later, of constant contact, Tony McCluskey has not shown a single trace of remorse to his father. And Anthony has now reconciled himself to the fact that he will never speak to his son again. Gemma was in a program famous for its ridiculous, over-the-top storylines. And yet what, what had happened to her was far more fantastical and awful than anything happening to any of the characters on the program. Thank you for watching. Murder UK is a website dedicated to giving the facts about murders and serial killers within the UK. Please consider subscribing and press that bell icon to be notified when we update new videos. Thank you.